And here we go. Welcome to the Great Work Insights Podcast by the OC Tanner Institute, the show that features the people, the professionals, the thought leaders, and the coolest companies. And now your host, the man navigating the discussion about the culture, the organized chaos, and the best practices that compel great work, Todd Nordstrom. Before we start today's show, let's do a little reality check. Let's just see how honest we're all being with ourselves by asking that age-old question, do you put your money where your mouth is? Of course, most of us would immediately answer that question with a firm and, and resolving response. We'd respond, of course I put my money where my mouth is, because none of us like the idea that we might be saying one thing but not believing in our own words enough to actually invest in those words. Now try this question. Would someone else base their financial decisions on your words? Or would you make financial decisions based on someone else's words? In life and at work, we all need people to buy into our words. It sounds funny talking about it. Um, It sounds funny like simple combinations of letters strewn together can have so much impact. But then again, we are a linguistic species. Words make us fall in love. They start wars. They build teams. They make transactions. Yes, they're words. Think about your most recent project. What words did you use to get people involved, to get a slice of the budget, or to get approval on that project? And when you pitch that project to a client, to your boss, or or maybe to your board of directors, how many eyes rolled with hesitation before someone in some way, shape, or form, asked you, yeah, well, you put your money where your mouth is. Our guest today, although I've only spent minutes with her on the phone, understands the impact of words. In fact, she is called upon to consult with many of the biggest organizations in the world about words and numbers. And ironically, she's a numbers person but also a word person. Please welcome to the show, Laura Rittenhouse, author of the new book, Investing Between the Lines, How to Make Smarter Decisions by Decoding CEO Communications. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you, Todd. Um, You have a fascinating background to me. And when I say that, I mean, you're a numbers-oriented person, right? You focus on investments, dollars, spreadsheets, bottom lines. I mean, that's what your, your, your juice is. I didn't mention it yet, but your book is endorsed by Warren Buffett. Are you a numbers person or a words person? Well, like Warren Buffett, Todd, I am both. Okay. And, uh, you know, why, why bring Warren Buffett into this? Uh, impressively, he is the only CEO in the world. And of course, he's been CEO for over 50 years now. Name, mm-hmm. <clears throat> name any other CEO that has that longevity. But he created an owner's manual for the Berkshire Hathaway company. Now, you know, so you buy a television, you buy a refrigerator, you get an owner's manual. So if you buy a stock of Berkshire, you get an owner's manual as well. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, what it represents is kind of the covenant he creates with his investors. If you buy into this business, this is what you can expect from us because we are manager partners. We own a lot of stock in this business. We are aligned with you. And one of the principles in that manual is the principle of candor. He says, we will be candid with you because we believe that is what you would expect of us if our places were reversed. But he also knows that candor is essential to creating ethical, trustworthy cultures. Fascinating. So when you buy into that, you the owner's manual isn't a spreadsheet that shows the numbers trending. It's it's actually the what you can expect from us as a company. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly right. Now let's give let's make one other example. Mm-hmm. Berkshire is, is a totally different business model. Um, it has no investor relations department. It's uh, one of the top companies in the world. It has no IR department. What is the IR program? It is the shareholder letter that Warren Buffett writes every year and publishes in his annual report. And it's the annual meeting held in Omaha over a weekend which he invites everybody to, all investors are invited to the meeting. 20,000, over 20,000 people come to this. Wow. And he sits 
<laughs> it's so incredible. Most companies figure out how they can avoid, they spend the least amount of time with investors answering questions. Buffett and Vice Chair Charlie Munger spent almost six hours oh, wow. answering questions. I love, I love this. For the audience, candor is not necessarily a word that we hear often, and it, and there might be some um, smudginess in in definition. I know that when you and I spoke on the phone last time, you shared with me um, your six rules of candor. Can you relate those to the audience? I I certainly will, Todd. And let me just offer a very powerful image to mm -hmm. frame this. So, uh, you know, we all want to know now because the, we've decoded DNA and so on, we want to go back and see what our genetic history is. Mm -hmm. I go back and look at the genetic history of words. So you go to the etymology. The word candor comes from a Latin word, candera, which means to illuminate like a candle does. Huh. And so what I understand from that is that leaders who choose to communicate candidly are those who are have the courage to shine light into dark places words that illuminate i love that so the six rules of candor are illuminating the what's real correct it's illuminating what's real and in fact i i never really connected this before todd so this is very interesting what i I, I can see as I look at these rules is that you you practice each one and what happens is it opens you up. So if you want to illuminate, it means you have to open up, you know, flashlight shines more light so you can see more. Mm -hmm. And that's what these rules are designed to do. So uh, let me just go over them quickly. Sure. The first rule, and this is so hard, and I think it's why people are a little nervous about candor. Uh, but the first rule is to own the power of your words. You spoke about this in your wonderful introduction. Words start wars. Mm -hmm. We fall in love with words. Words are so powerful. People will say to me, oh, can we predict the market? What's the market going to do? And I, you know, Warren Buffett will be the first person to say, no one can predict the market. However, the words that you are using, that you and I are using right now, are creating our future and the future of the world. So it's really, it's it's very, very important and it means that we need to be accountable for our words that's number one okay. number two in being accountable we can have the most meaningful conversations when we're clear in our intent and purpose like why am i talking why are we talking right now i'm i'm clear that i want to support you in this podcast to support your clients so it's all oh, that's that's you can own the power of your words and then be disciplined and being clear in that purpose. Third is be authentic, original and energetic. Speak from your head and your heart. We all know that uh, we've got a right brain and a left brain and and the left brain is our analytic, our deductive capabilities. The right brain is our emotional intelligence, our imagination. Both are essential to leadership today. So uh, the. Um, communications that are the most impactful to all of your stakeholders are the ones that have originality. If you speak in cliches and platitudes and other things, it's just, it's not going to work. Interesting. So uh, the, the fourth, the fourth uh, rule is to be honest and truthful in what you say and do. Now, this is why I think, again, people are a little nervous about candor because we, we know that it's, we knew from when we were little kids how important it was mm -hmm. to tell the truth. And you knew when you didn't that it was, a, it was wrong. And somehow as we get, we get older and we grow up, uh, this becomes a little more blurred. But um, uh, the, the philosopher Immanuel Kant spoke about this. And he said, you know, the truth is no human being can ent be entirely candid. They're just... It's, it's just it's just not humanly possible. However, we can strive to be truthful in what we say. In other words, sometimes we leave things out because it might hurt somebody's feelings. It might compromise our competitive advantage. So we do leave things out. We're not being entirely truthful. Sure. But at least in what we say, if we can be truthful, that's it. And the most important reason is Mark Twain's advice. Tell the truth because then you, then you never have to remember what you said. I love that. Love that. Okay, two more rules. Okay. Know your audience. Oh my goodness, how many times do I forget this rule? Uh, because we get so consumed by what is it that we want to say 
we forget that we're speaking to an audience and the truth, the, the reality is the audience is only able to hear certain things because they have their filters on, they have their particular orientations, interests. Sure, so sure. you need to be cognizant of that to make sure that you're using communication, not just to kind of flaunt who you are and your message, but to connect with them. Words are for connection. And finally, uh, and this is one I love, use verbs a lot and adjectives and adverbs sparingly. Be simple, be direct. Um, one of the great CEOs around is Richard Anderson, who is the CEO of Delta Airlines. And why do I say he's great? Recently, I flew on Delta. I had, I had not flown them in a while. And I had one of the most pleasant air, airline uh, trips that I've had in a very long time, which is not something you can say <laughs> much these days, as you well know. However, what's interesting is that at the time he took over Delta, when he was you know, trying to turn this this almost bankrupt airline around, he published a, um, a talk and the talk was use verbs. Hmm. And he was basically saying what I'm telling you today, that uh, it's verbs that make the world go round. And again, if your verbs, because it's action, it takes the, the ideas that we're using our words to describe and puts them into the world in, as actions. And if we're being true to our purpose and the, um, the authenticity of the connections that we want to create, those verbs can make really important, profound change. Those six rules are, are absolutely fascinating. What, you know, as you were going through them, I was thinking about, you know, that comment that you made that it's, it's, um, it's impossible to be a hundred percent, you have a hundred percent candor. And, and that makes perfect sense because, you know, what, even if our intention is pure honesty, um, we don't necessarily know what our audience, which is one of the other rules, know your audience is picking up for us. That's fascinating rules. Love those. So when you, when you work with your clients, um, coaching and training them to lead with candor, is this th something that you just go to the C-suite with, or does this have to go through an entire organization? Typically, I enter a company through the C-suite. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to, to talk about two faces, we'll call them faces of this business, which is very much the coaching, which I absolutely love. Because to, to work with a team and to experience with them the transformation that happens mm -hmm. just simply by adopting candor. And one of the things that happens, of course, um, in, this, in this work is that the, the teams, instead of speaking in PowerPoint bullet points, you know, so it's a kind of a data dump. And a lot of communications are data dumps what we do is begin to tell the story of the company. And it's amazing how many companies have lost their way in telling their story. Yeah. And not only have they lost their way, but they will learn it and then they will forget it again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think it's just because, you know, we, well, let's face it. We live in a soundbite world. We do. You're so, right. And, and so many companies have lost their stories and, and forget that those stories about maybe it's the founding of the company or that big hurdle overcome or, or one of those things that actually communicates the company's values and their mission and why they exist in the first place. So essential. So essential. Because that's, that's where the heart comes in. And again... Uh, you know, it's not, it's not either, or you've got to have both the head engaged and the heart engaged. Laura, I want to, I want to go back to, um, Warren Buffett because obviously, you know, to, you mentioned knowing how a Warren Buffett type thinks. Um, I'm sure the audience is curious to know, you know, Warren Buffett, what does Warren Buffett look for in companies? I mean, you talked about the letter he writes, but what is he looking for? I did an interview with him a number of years ago, Todd, and asked him uh, that very question. Uh, one of the things he looks for is, did the CEO write the shareholder letter? Now, um, 
Do you mean as opposed to somebody else writing it? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. In fact, you know, we live in a very cynical world, a cynical time, and for um, in in many cases, there's reasons for that. When I speak to investors, they very few of them think a CEO ever really writes the letter. Hmm. Now, I think there's a subtlety here. Let me just deal with that quickly. Uh, I say I want to know if a CEO authored the letter because you know you're a terrific writer. You know writing is not easy. Mm-mm. Not everybody can write really, really well, and it takes a lot of work. So some CEOs just don't have that skill. However, they have people who have that skill, but they have to author the ideas, the intent of that uh, communication in the letter, the um, decide what goals that they want to achieve in communicating uh, the both the past of what happened during the year and then where the company is going. Uh, it's so important. So he wanted to know if the, if the CEO really authored the letter and why did he want to know that? Because he said, and this is a quote, a lot of CEOs don't understand their businesses. That's a tough statement. Very tough. Very tough. And when you when you say their businesses, are you referring to culture? Are you referring what are you referring to? Or what was well, he referring now, to? This is great, Todd, because now we can dive into the book Investing Between the Lines. Mm-hmm. Um your to answer your question, I have to tell you that it's taken me almost twenty years to develop this methodology that we use to actually measure the amount of candor in a community in a CEO executive communication. Okay. And um, I, you know, I wrote the book to describe how we invented this methodology. And the most simple way to tell you uh, what what's behind the methodology and to answer your question is imagine like we have in our bodies, we know we have the circulatory system, the nervous system, our muscular system. Just like that, a business has an anatomical uh, combination of systems that all have to work together. And I've identified six, sorry, uh, seven of these systems um, based on reading thousands and thousands of shareholder letters over the years. And I've learned that most companies will will talk about some of these systems um, to a greater or lesser extent. So the systems are capital stewardship, what, how can I read this shareholder letter and learn if the CEO and the executive suite feels they are entitled to investor capital or are entrusted with investor capital? We wow. saw at, at the Enron, Enron taught us about the former mm-hmm. CEOs who felt they were entitled to it. The other systems are the strategy, the strategic system. Now that has to be supported by systems of accountability. Because without accountability systems, you don't know if you're executing your strategy. So those those are three now, three of the systems. Okay. Another system is vision. Stakeholders, employees, investors, everybody needs to know where you came from and where you are, which you can, which you explained by telling your strategy. But they also need to know where you're going, and that requires the vision system, an ability to talk about the purpose and how the purpose is consistent with uh, an understanding of where the world is trending and how that's impacting the business and how that's impacting the stakeholders. So now vision needs to be supported by a strong leader. Mm -hmm. And we've identified various topics that tell us the strength that can communicate how strong that leadership is. Because let's face it, if you have strong leadership, you're going to have a very compelling vision. If you have weak leadership, your vision is going to be a bit flaky or not compelling. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, let's look at the last two systems. We've covered five now. And that's the system, the stakeholder system, which um, reveals the quality of relationships that a company has, the management has with all of its stakeholders, customers, employees, investors, and then you could go to the next level, um, suppliers, regulators, and so on. Now, here's where we get to the system that 
our system here is the only system in the world that includes this element of a business, and that's the commitment to candor. Because without candor, you cannot have trusting relationships. And without trust, everything falls apart. There are a lot of um, listeners right now who maybe they're, they're leaders, they're um, HR leaders, and, and they're focused on changing and improving many of the aspects you mentioned. Is your book, is it a method to show the value behind all those things, or is it a how to improve these things? Well, it's both. It's both. It's, it's a measure. It shows you how we actually measure these things, but it's also, I, I'm, I included lots of stories mm -hmm. about companies who modeled positive and negative um, aspects of these different systems. Um, and, uh, and, and, and many of these stories are really inspiring. You know, the, the, the leader, the leaders who, who have chosen to take the courage, take the, uh, to take the candor pledge and, and lay it out lay it out so people know that this is real. I can't wait to check out your book, but let me let me play uh, devil's advocate for a second here and I'm I'm guessing I know what the answer when it comes to your book and your system after 20 years will you put your money where your mouth is? Haha. <laughs> here comes the here comes the, the multiple cherries on the cake, okay? okay. Frosting cherries whatever. Uh, every year for the past 10 years we have uh, what we do is we create a hundred company benchmark survey of companies. Mm -hmm. So uh, we measure the candor in each one of these companies and rank order companies from high exemplary candor to low candor. And then what we do is we correlate the market performance, total return of those companies for a year, the year about when the letter came out and then the following year. And what we have found is that over the past 10 years, companies that have ranked in the top quartile of our survey have produced results that are over three times, wow. three times better than the market. Wow. That's that's good stuff, uh, Laura. If 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 uh, this is fascinating, um, now you've got my head spinning, and uh, and we could go on and on and on, but um, unfortunately we can't. If listeners want to learn more about your books, um, your systems, and you, um, you have three books. Where can they find you? Where can they find your books? So you can go to Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, to find the books. Mm -hmm. um, you can find me. Uh, at our on our website www.rittenhouserankings.com that's one word rittenhouse r i t t e n h o u s e by the way named after our ancestor david rittenhouse who made george washington's first pair of bifocals oh wow so we continue bringing clear vision to our leaders well <laughs> thank you so much for your time today laura it's always fascinating Todd, thank you so much. I've enjoyed the conversation. What did you think of today's show? The conversation continues on www.octanner.com. Be sure to leave us a comment. Also, remember to rate, review, and subscribe to all our podcasts on iTunes. Now get out there and build something beautiful. It's your turn now.